one for a commissioner of the Kingdom of Tonga, and we were very privileged to have you with us this afternoon. And I'd now like to hand over to the chair of the next plenary, Talanoa, Associate Professor Sinclair Dinan, <coughs> chairing the plenary on security, peace building, and conflict resolution in the Pacific. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nata. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Your Majesty, um, welcome back to the second plenary session. Um, and the topic for this session is security, peace building, and conflict resolution in the Pacific. Uh, we're scheduled to have <coughs> three speakers. We currently only have two. So uh, we might have a little bit more time for Talana than originally anticipated. But let me just go begin by saying that um, the region that we are talking about is one which has by and large been spared the uh, degree of, of large-scale conflict that we see besetting so many uh, other parts of the world. Um, but it is not immune to conflict. Um, and there certainly have been conflicts, not only at a national level, in the case of uh, countries like uh, Papua New Guinea in relation to Bougainville, uh, and, and also most recently the Solomon Islands, but there are many conflicts, of course, and forms of disputation that happen at a much lower level uh, on, a, on an everyday um, uh, level. Um, in the Pacific as indeed they do anywhere else, including Australia. Um, and whilst uh, there's a lot said, particularly in Australia, about issues of stability, conflict and security in addressing the <coughs> region, there is usually far less said about peacemaking, about conflict resolution. Uh, and about the efforts that often are fairly invisible, uh, certainly when viewed from afar, to try and manage disputation. Um, the region is actually home to one of the most successful peacekeeping and peacemaking um, uh, exercises uh, in the world in the form of the Bougainville peace process. Uh, and again, at lower levels, we see lots of really quite remarkable initiatives <coughs> taking place within civil society uh, at the community level uh, around attempts to uh, contain, to manage, and to resolve conflict. And I hope that we might be hearing a little bit about that from uh, our speakers. We have three very distinguished speakers two of whom are currently with us. So I will proceed to uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, and we're anticipating a, a, an address of about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll open up. Our first speaker is uh, His Excellency Mr. Baraki Gina, who is the High Commissioner of Solomon Islands to Australia. Uh, he is a, a, a career uh, diplomat who's had a very long and distinguished career serving his country uh, in a variety of capacities in a number of uh, different uh, countries. Prior to coming to Canberra in 2010, uh, he was Solomon Islands ambassador to the Republic of China, that was Taiwan, uh, between 2003 and 2010. Prior to that, he was minister, counselor in charge d'affaires to the UN in New York. Uh, and in the uh, mid-1990s, he was councillor and deputy head uh, of mission at the European Commission in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, he's also uh, spent uh, a considerable period of time working for the Ministry of State back in Tomiara. So without further ado, let me introduce you to His Excellency, Mr. Baraki Gina.
thank you, uh, Chairman of the panel and distinguished guests. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, uh, panel discussion on security, peace building, <coughs> and conflict resolution in the Pacific. I will contribute briefly to the discussion in the context of Solomon Islands and to focus on Ramsey original assistance mission to Solomon Islands, Ramsey. But before doing so, I wish for the benefit of uh, some members of our audience briefly introduce Solomon Islands to you. <coughs> Solomon Islands is a group of islands lie east of Papua New Guinea and northeast of Australia. The group comprises six main islands and more than 900 smaller ones which form the archipelago. Solomon Islands is home to more than 90% of indigenous Melanesians and a small percentage of Polynesians and Macronesians followed by other minority groups. Solomon Islands is believed to have been first settled more than 10,000 years ago. The first European to visit the islands was the Spanish explorer Alvaro de Medan in 1568. <coughs> and European missionaries and traders arrived in several parts of the group in the mid 19th century. The islands became a British protectorate in 19, or 1893, gained self governing status in 1976, and achieved political independence in 1970. When Britain left in 1978, Solomon Islands as a newly independent country was largely a group of undeveloped islands with a narrow economic base dependent almost entirely on foreign aid and less than a handful of natural resources exploited for export marketing. Solomon Islands saw the intense battle between the Japanese and the Allied forces during World War II and the Battle of Gorokna was said to be the turning point of the Pacific theater of World War II campaign. Solomon Islands is a diverse, it's a diverse country, diverse in culture and traditions. There are hundreds of different uh, tribes practicing their own traditions and cultural values. And some 80 different languages and numerous dialects are spoken in the Solomons, but English is the official language and Pidgin English is commonly used by the majority of people to communicate. The land, as is in every uh, other Pacific Island campus, is an intricate part of the Solomon Islands culture. More than 80% of the land is owned by tribes. And by tradition, no one individual has exclusive ownership to a piece of land. Each member of the tribe has usage right to the land. And by law, traditional land is not for sale. <coughs> um, an ethnic crisis in Solomon Islands. Decades old grievances and disagreements between the people or certain people of Guadalcanal and Malaita escalated into a full ethnic unrest in 1998, involving armed conflicts. The underlying disputes involved around or over uh, land, uh, tension over land and divergent cultural differences and unequal opportunities, economic opportunities. And as a result, the ethnic unrest, the entire country was affected. State services, institutions severely eroded and the economy declined to near collapse. And on the island of Gorokhnau, where the capital Honiara is located, many homes were burned down, the occupants brutalized, killed, or taken hostage. Honiara was no safe zone either. Militants freely move around the capital with high powered guns, <coughs> causing fear and threaten people who they think were on the wrong side of the conflict. The city was virtually under siege, and the government machinery was not functioning in a normal way, and businesses were severely affected. 
the armed conflict between the two warring parties was ended after the signing of the Founders for Peace Agreement in 2000. However, the end to the conflict was replaced by widespread violence and intimidation. The presence of high-powered guns and ammunition was a major concern and were the cause of major crimes committed in the capital and in other parts of the country. <coughs> the planned dis disarmament under the uh, Townsville Peace Agreement yielded little results. High-powered guns and ammunition were still in the hands of few criminal elements going around terrorizing and threatening the citizens. The very much compromised Royal Sovereign Police was incapable of controlling and resolving the situation. All efforts in trying to break through the crisis were ineffective. The problem we found ourselves in was deep-rooted and the state was neither has neither the capacity nor the resources to take the count forward. The only way out or the way forward was to seek for outside assistance. The Regional Assistance Mission to Southern Islands, Ramsey. The Australia-led Regional Assistance Mission to Southern Islands, Ramsey, a regional intervention force of more than 2,000 police, civilian and military personnel, was organized and deployed to Southern Islands on 23 July 2003. <coughs> the objective of the mission was clear and simple to restore law and order, and to rebuild and re reform the key government institutions and the economy. Ramsey's intervention from day one was decisive and effective. The mission was overwhelming and with an overwhelming success. The significant success achieved within the first few days was the re-establishment of safe, secure environment for the people in and around the capital to resume the normal way of life. The government and business houses resumed normal functions and activities without fear and intimidation. Ramsey was soon visible in other parts of the country. Ramsey brought long-awaited uh, hopes to the vast majority of our people. Ramsey was like a savior to them. During the past nine years, Southern Islands have been literally transformed from a failed state to a functioning democracy once more. Substantive progress, progress and gains were achieved in all sectors of the country. Law and order were restored, and major public and private sector reforms which were carried out in the past nine years resulted in significant improvement in performances and productivity, improved governance and real growth to the economy. Next year, 2013, will mark the 10th anniversary of Ramsey presence in Southern Islands. It is also the year planned for the beginning of the transition phase of Ramsey. The Ramsey transition is an opportunity for Solomon Islands, for Solomon Islanders to step up to the plate, to steer the country to a better and brighter future. While the transition of Ramsey is welcomed, the government holds a strong view that the transition is task bound and not time bound, and that the pace of transition across various se sectors must continue to be done in close consultation with the government. The transition phase is an important stage of any peace building efforts in any post-conflict situations or environment. <coughs> it is important that all stakeholders in the peace process, in the peace process building the host government, must include the host government and must ensure that whatever is put in place in the transition phase will be able to hold, support, sustain, and enhance the gains that have been achieved. And that is the challenge Southern Islands must rise to. 
prior to Ramsey's intervention, various uh, regional and international initiatives failed to yield results in bringing back normalcy to the country. The government of Southern Islands also explored possibilities of bringing a foreign military force to curb the violence and lawlessness. An approach was also made to the United Nations to deploy a UN mission to the country. These exploratory efforts were not successful due to a number of uh, reasons. <coughs> However, following successful meeting in June 2003 between the two then, the then two Prime Ministers of Australia and Solomon Islands, John Howard and uh, Say Ivan Kenakeza, a mutual agreement was reached for Australia to take a lead role in facilitating assistance to Solomon Islands. The change of the Australian government's policy towards assisting a neighbour in a serious security uh, crisis situation was widely welcomed by the people of Solomon Islands after having gone through five years of fear and instability. While Ramsey may be regarded as an intervention mission, I think it is fair to describe it as a partnership mission. It is a partnership mission that has national, bilateral and regional elements in it. First, Ramsey was approved or deployed on invitation by the government of Solomon Islands. An act of parliament known as the uh, <coughs> Facilitation of International Assistance Act of 2003 was passed by the parliament and with support of both sides of the house. From my original perspective, Ramsey was deployed under the auspices of the PK Tower Declaration, a declaration by the uh, members of the Pacific Islands Forum, not for punitive measures, but in essence, a regional mechanism for the members to reach out to each other in situations of instabilities. The crisis in Solomon Islands saw for the first time terms of the PK Tower Declaration triggered the uh, deployment of Ramsey. It is important to note that under the terms of the Big Eternal Declaration, expressed approval and invitation must be granted by the host country before a foreign force of whatever nature is deployed. Ramsey not only has the uh, bipartisan support of the feminine apart the Parliament of Solomon Islands, but also the, the support of the entire population of Southern Islands. And that is why, in contrast to other peacekeeping and intervention missions around the world, Ramsey is a success story for the people of Southern Islands. And it is a success story about regional cooperation. Ramsey is a model for intervention and conflict resolution that countries countries in other parts of the world could and should emulate. It is not mere intervention, it is more about comprehensive partnership between the conflict country and regional governments and institutions. Led by Australia, all the members of the Pacific Islands Forum participate and contribute to the mission. As a host country, Southern Islands was fortunate to have the support of the forum member countries and the benefit of participating in all regional concept, uh, meetings to monitor and review the progress of Ramsey. In addition to the Ramsey special uh, coordinator who by mutual arrangement a senior Australian diplomat based in Honiara to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the mission, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary has its own envoy on the ground who consults with the government of Solomon Islands and Ramsey and reports to the Secretariat. At the national level, the country not only facilitated the deployment of Ramsey through, the act of, through an act of parliament, but also took necessary uh, actions to secure, to ensure Ramsey's state its goals to bring about normalcy and lasting peace to the country and the people. 
the establishment of the Ramsey Coordination Office within the Prime Minister's Office, the establishment of the uh, Ministry of Peace and National Reconciliation, the enactment of the uh, legislation which, is, which establishes the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, therefore paving the way for reconciliation and healing processes between those involved in the conflict and affected by the crisis are among the positive steps taken by the government. Collaborating and cooperating with countries <coughs> and the development partners on various uh, institutional and economic reforms programs were important commitments by the, uh, by the government as well. I think by way of uh, conclusion, <coughs> in many lessons have been learned through Ramsey intervention in South Islands during the past nine years. But one that stands out clear is for any intervention mission to succeed, the host country must play a key role in the process and not as a bystander. <coughs> to secure success, clear guidelines must be established on responsibilities and roles of every stakeholder during the uh, intervention. The host country must be part of the peace building process. The host country must be given the necessary uh, confidence to create a conducive local environment in order for the intervention to discharge its mission's objectives effectively <coughs> and successfully. And the host country must be a partner a consultative partner throughout the peace and confidence, confidence building process. Partnership with the host country must be at the core of the foreign, uh, foreign interventions, in peace building, confidence building, and reforming or rebuilding a country and its economy that to be achieved and sustained. Thank you. We're going to move straight on to our second panellist, um, who is Ms. Arietta Koya Costella Olson. Um, Koya is a peace practitioner um, who has long experience uh, in the Pacific. Um, she is currently the director for the Pacific Centre for Peace Building, which is based in Suva. Um, and she is engaged in, in peace building uh, work uh, at a variety of, of levels in a number of different uh, institutional contexts, including in churches, um, in the private sector, uh, working with regional agencies, um, working with the military forces uh, in the case of Fiji, uh, and she has also worked across the region um, in a number of different countries, including Tonga, Solomon Islands, Samoa, Vanuatu, and PNG, in addition to Fiji itself. Um, she is also uh, an alumnus of the Centre for Justice and Peace Building uh, at the Eastern Mennonite University uh, in Harrisburg, Virginia. And I think she's going to address us today uh, on some of her uh, her own work, uh, which is very much at the practical end uh, of peace building work. So, Hola, welcome. I wish to extend our greetings from the board, staff, colleagues, and friends from the Pacific Center for Peace Building. I wish to also acknowledge and thank traditional owners of this land, of the past and the present. I also wish to acknowledge Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, organizers of Talanoa, to thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you. I know Sione Javier for some time now, and I was part of his earlier conversations. I promised him I would join Talanoa when I felt I had enough to share. <laughs> so that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Please bear with me as I go through this presentation. You may find the slides are very, very worthy, and that's because I had intention to share it with you, because I know it will be something that will be part of the conference papers. Please don't pay too much attention to the lots and lots of words. 
I know I have 20 minutes. I will try to honor the 20 minutes. But I would like to say that the way I share my story is about the work that PCP does regionally, as well as most importantly nationally, which is of great interest to all of you, particularly with where we are at in our political situation. So I have a few videos, a few stories to tell in between, so I hope you will stay on this journey. Okay, now this is where it gets tricky. I hope I can master this. Um, just want to show a very short <coughs> My conversation is on strengthening human security from a peace-building perspective in Fiji and the Pacific. Just to tell you about who we are, you probably heard for the first time who, what this organization, the word of PCP, where we come from, why do we exist, what has been our approach to peace-building in this area, and what, what are some of the lessons to share. We were formed in 2007 after we left ECRIA. ECRIA is the Ecumenical Center for Research, Ed Education and Advocacy. It was the former Fiji Council of Churches Research Group. For your information, currently the Fiji Council of Churches no longer is functioning back home since 2006. Where I was the Peace Program Coordinator from June until November, our vision is creating a just, peaceful, and sustainable Pacific. Our mission is Pacific people transforming, reducing, and preventing violent conflicts. We're being pioneers in the area of peace-building initiatives in Fiji, and this is reflected in our many partnerships and collaboration with government, NGOs, CSOs, locally, regionally, and internationally. Our values are respect for human rights, most importantly, what I want to highlight here is our valuing practice and teaching principled nonviolence, grounded in Pacific traditions and informed by other traditions. This is a picture taken at the Pacific Theological College for the last three years now. I have been co-facilitating, co-teaching courses in peace building. It's called the Pacific Peace Builders Training Intensive. This year was the first time we ran certificate courses in peace building. From next year, we will have, we will have certificates in counseling. Leslie from the Solomon Islands, Islands was a student with us. He did an attachment with us. Also an artist and works for the Anglican Church of Melanesia. Part of our process is not only teaching conflict analysis, but using our knowledge, our arts, to be able to depict how we understand conflict occurs. And you'll see Leslie's pictures in the background where he talks about the conflicts or the some of the traumatic situations that happened in the Solomons. <coughs> Our approach to conflict and enhancing human security, we believe that conflict is best dealt with at an early stage, that we need to have the methods to recognize and deal with it effectively. Conflict is natural, it, is, it also depends on how you deal with it. We seek to strengthen traditional and Western peace building knowledge and strategies using a hybrid approach with communities, NGOs, and government to transform, reduce, and prevent conflict. And here we're talking specifically, and most of the time, about violent conflict. 
key issues that are causing conflicts and human insecurity, and this is probably not only true for Fiji but for the region, land tenure and the changing land use patterns in the context of increasingly competitive international markets and trade liberalization, <coughs> resource extraction, which accepts, accepts <coughs> anyway, you know the word, <coughs> underlying conflict dynamics because of the disregard for local concepts of land ownership and inadequate participation of communities in decision making. Rapid demographic changes, coupled with the lack of income and employment opportunities, and the continued imbalance between the wages and cost of living. Lack of awareness and effective strategies for dealing with the effects of trauma and stress for individuals, communities, and organizations. Inadequacy of traditional methods and processes of dealing with conflict in a rapidly changing context, and lack of appropriate consultation and dialogue with people on development and change. What we do, we provide facilitation, training, counseling, mentoring, mediations in the areas of peace building and conflict transformation. We're a new team of 12. We're a multi-ethnic, multi-religious team. We have two offices based in Suva and in Lombasa, and our other large island. This work, human security, we first learned about this word in 2007 when there was a UNDP consultation and the focus was on discussing a regional partnership for the advancement of women's human security concerns, a regional platform for civil society to lobby and cooperate to advance human security and a regional human security framework for consideration at the June 2007 Pacific Island <coughs> Forum Secretariat Forum Regional Security Council meeting, FRC. In the past, FRC meetings have been kept to government only, mostly to discuss security issues. With our lobbying and approach, we've been able to input into dialogue sessions before FRC meetings. Again, it's important when we're using words that we understand what we mean by these words, and in this case, human security has these different aspects to it. This part here speaks specifically, and I think it's important because some of us do pay attention what goes on to F what happens with the ships and FRC, but most importantly, the lobbying that has gone on, the collaboration because of NGOs working with PIPs, particularly when my country, Fiji, is not allowed into the PIPs at the moment, but because we're a regional organization, we're able to attend these CSO dialogues, therefore be a part of the lobby movement for human security. The establishment of a regional working group on women, peace, and security, the dialogue processes, a very important um, collaboration that's existed between UNDP and this program on strengthening capacities for peace and development, whereby quite a few Pacific Island countries, both government and CSOs, have undergone training. This research on the Urban Youth Report a youth leadership and peace building conference, the advancement of the discussion on the security sector reform, the development of land management and conflict minimization policies, mm -hmm. and the research on climate change. More recently, the human security framework, and this quite a comprehensive document you can look at, has now been passed. And I attended last month the launch of the Women's Peace and Security Action Regional Action Plan. <coughs> At a national level, PCP has worked with Feminine Pacific, a women's media organization, to raise awareness on human security. <coughs> Women from the communities have come forward and talked in the dialogues. And we have also written a, a handbook on 1325. Our approach is influenced also by our context. Our role as facilitators and, and trainers in the organization has enabled us to work with different target groups. We needed to reclaim our space for dialogue and to rebuild trust and broken relationships. Many of us are linked to each other or related to each other. The road has been one full of challenge, risk, fun, commitment, long nights, eating, drinking, grieving, living together, empathy, anger, disappointment, 
re resilience and grief. It has required us to be focused and to be persistent and to have faith in God and in our people. It also is about holding a candle of hope, burning all the time so that there is always light during our darkest moments in our lives. It's also about taking opportunities when they, you think they are none and taking the chance to test the space for conversation on difficult topics. This is being a time when the space has been open for young people to enter into intergenerational dialogue on sensitive issues, where women's voices are being heard but need to be acknowledged, where women and marginalized groups are speaking out more as these issues are getting more complicated. This dialogue, this picture is taken of a mother and daughter, and um, this is with regards to the constitution making process. The fact that you have somebody who is in her 30s and her mom who's in her 80s, I thought it was a very special photograph. And the, her daughter, by the way, was saying, what is PCP going to do for us? Because most of our issues that we want to put in the constitution about the fact that we, are, we can't live, yeah? Most of our human needs can't be met. And you know what my dream is? I want a honeybee farm. I said, okay, that's fine. I'm sure that could happen. And then she says, and I want to take the honeybees to the market to sell. <laughs> <laughs> we burst out laughing. We said, dear lady, if you take the honeybees, everybody in the market will run away <laughs> because you can only sell the honey. I want to specifically talk about our involvement in the constitution process. We work with eight communities in Wano level, keeping in mind that the preparation for the constitution process was very short, yeah? So we had to make the most of the time available to, to us. Thankfully, UNDP CPAD was able to channel funds. With that, there was a call for proposals and about 130 civil society groups around Fiji applied. Therefore, it helped with the outreach of the constitution um, development process. We also helped the Rambi Youth for Development to design and implement their workshops. We were able to facilitate and hear the voices of 250 participants who made 52 written submissions and three verbal submissions. This is group activity, Vano level style. So if you get tired of sitting on chairs, you come to Vano level, we have workshops at also um, require lying on the floor and thinking. <laughs> Our submission to enhance human security with regards to the, what we had put in as an organization, we spoke about the truth and reconciliation process, the Bill of Rights, the Constituent Assembly, safeguarding and implementation of the Constitution, electoral system and power sharing, the judiciary, the security forces, the Bosselev Vakturama, marginalized groups, youth and education, social entitlements, health, land and agriculture. You may go to our website if you wish to get a copy of our submission. This is the participants from Buya village, Bua Banolebu. These people are three hours out of, of um, Lambasa, yeah? So as you move out of the town area, the issues get complicated because you're talking about infrastructure, lack of access to fresh water, electricity. These people are farmers. They have grown lots and lots of grog, lots and lots of dalo. What they don't have, they're rich in resources. They also have access to the sea, is the ability to sell their crops, the cash economy. Yeah? So this becomes quite problematic. So as we work with these 16 communities in one level, these are the things that we will be working with with them and with government about. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Koila, uh, and perfect times. We have approximately 15 minutes left for Tower Now. Um, so the floor is now open if you'd like to perhaps identify yourself uh, and identify the panelist who you would like to address your question. Yes, um, both in the first 
They said, I'm paying. The law said apply here are applying in Fiji now. Fijians are no longer the Fijian natives. We've changed the word. It's now indigenous. It's now headmen instead of chief. All the words have changed. And so now it's a psychological warfare. Luckily, nobody is in prison. There, anyone who holds a position in the native government or in the church government, we want to throw into prison because then people will come away from this respect for elders, respect for leaders. Now we can just speak openly about anybody. Oh, he's a thief. Who? Watch what you say. Watch what you, because this is a psychological warfare to break down all this respect. And then what do we end up with? We end up with the Aboriginal community. So why break something that has been good for so long? I mean, the money, we seem to put money as a God. No, we have Jesus as God. So this whole thing, we have to bring God into it, that all these things will disappear, including money and wealth. Judge people. So I am saying today, Fiji, it's not the peace that you used to know. Because I live with Aboriginal. Since 1994, when I gave up everything and went and lived with it. And I know what I'm talking about because my home has been full of it. In prison, out of prison, in hospital, stabbing, everything. Now, we're starting to raise up a young leader in Tamar. Three times we applied, took him to Fiji, took him to Pacific, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, everyone's coming in. We are not unskilled workers. We're very skilled in peace building and leadership. But we can help Australia with their indigenous, with their natives. We don't have to come and pick their fruit. We can come here and help them in Dungi and everywhere. Like that. They can't do it. You know? And why are we just... We can't talk anymore because it's all capitalism now. One world government is being rolled out. We need to stand up. I want to rob all the Mara and said, oh, we need to written anything. Yes, sir, I have written it. Give it to me. And see, they've changed him out. He's over here somewhere. So I better find him. So, the thing is, that civic need to speak up. We have something to offer the world. We're not just unskilled workers. We are very skilled in leadership and peace building. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, just a point of correction. The Charter is not the law. It's a guiding document. It doesn't replace the Constitution. It's the guiding document. We're, we're ruled by decrees right now. A lot of the decrees have to be in line with the spirit of the Charter. The Charter itself is a fantastic document. The how the Charter was made is the point of contention. Because in the creation of a country, a nation, or documents, you have to look at the how process by which you make a document. So many of our people grapple with the how, and we're all at different parts of our journey. Yeah? Some of us are over here, some of us are here. Nevertheless, we all need to get involved. In the involvement, though, we need to acknowledge the pain, the insult, the challenge that we have, and to ensure what kind of peace are we building here. In peace building, there's two types of peace. The terminology, negative peace or positive peace. The type of peace we're talking about building is positive peace, where you go to the root causes of the conflict to understand what is driving this conflict. Because unfortunately, what we, we, are, what we have today is also, depending on how you analyze the conflict, is also indicative of what was going on in the past. So, we have the past to deal with, we have the present to deal with today. And in creating spaces so that we have our elders who are involved in those conversations, as well as our young people. Because you have young people who are voting in 2014 who have no memory of democracy. They only know what coups are like. So we are asking the majority of 200,000 plus new voters to lead our country. With what are they going to go back to to guide them? So the importance of having the space of elders who know some semblance of what good governance is like. The importance of having 
space is created so that we can have traditional, religious, a space that embraces all, that's not exclusive, because our policies of the past were very exclusive. We inherited very discriminatory <coughs> policies. So in as much as there's multiple changes going on, changing policies, changing mindsets, changing hearts, we have all of this to grapple with. And we, as people who live in Fiji, need to ensure that as we navigate these waters, that the violence doesn't break out, that we have the hard conversations that need to be had without violence. We're able to confront people respectfully, but to work these things out. Because, yes, you're right, it's six years. Laws are being created. It's going to take a while as we talk about the transition process, which laws have to be undone because they contradict all these other laws. It's a massive exercise. And it's one in which many of us have to get involved in. What I'm saying is, at the expense of 560,000 Aborigines, you know, I speak quite openly here in the legal um, area, 560,000 Aborigines, I've been mean, told very clearly, well, you know, there are only 560,000 people. So for the majority of 20 million people, it's okay. Now, oh, it's half of these in the Fijian nation. When you touch the law, you touch the heart of the people. And that's where I believe violence will you. And this that's is what's happening <coughs> now. And that's, that's why it is important, particularly now, to have these very carefully, respectful Talanoa sessions. Because this point in time, and you saw what our submissions were on, yeah? Many of our people talked about that. You changed our names. Did you consult us? Yeah? You disregarded the Bosley of Wakaturanga. Did the chiefs have any say in that? No, they didn't. So along the way, there's been huge changes to culture that have threatened people's identity. Those conversations have to continue because it's also too many changes. Yes, my chief, Ratu Inoke, is my chief. I am from the Muso. Yes, he is in prison. How does the Vonua get run when your high chief is in jail? practically speaking, for the next 15 years. All these conversations are important, and they need to be continued to be had in, with intergenerations, huh? not just the old people talking, because the young people look, are looking for guidance as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, uh, could we, sorry, could we uh, see if anyone else has <coughs> got uh, a contribution that they would like to make? Because we're coming very close <coughs> to the end of this session. I'm sure we can continue this conversation uh, informally, but as this session is to end. Thank you. Um, Hale is my name, and I'd like to thank you both for your um, presentation. Um, I was a bit emotional um, because I think the examples of Fiji and Solomon has been the ideal of the Pacific to become okay, a democratic nation. And um, this man told what was said before. And in both examples, it seems to me that we hold it as an ideal, and when we get there, we don't know what, where to go from there. The push is also um, in Tonga. And so I'm asking, or oh, I'm challenging, is this, is this a form of government that will best serve us as Pacific Islanders, judging from the two things, the two governments that are happy where the battlefield is at the moment, in Oceania. Anyone else who is bursting to stand up? The, the, the focus of peace building is dealing with, with tension issues recent, that happened recently in Fiji, Solomon Islands, in other places. My question is, is someone doing something about the tension that has happened in the past? For example, the Tongans came to the Lao group, the Samoans came to Tuvalu, and went to Rarotonga 
and have someone going to road two miles for well. Some ones are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we can deal with what has just happened, but there is something lurking behind the, under the surface from way back when our people were not <coughs> really peaceful. Is, is something happening in that area? How, how, would you, how would you like to proceed with this um, condition? Would you want to? Um, yeah, I, I think that's an issue that not only is um, common, like in common, someone, but even in Solomon Islands, mm -hmm. we have this. Um, we've never been a one country, so we a, a nation of different tribes, and we always fight that. And that's the challenge we have at the moment. Is to be able to bring together different uh, cultures and uh, exactly what we uh, may be one of the root causes of the uh, ethnic unrest that we had in uh, uh, 2000 or 1998. Um, and it's a, it's a big challenge for, for countries like Southern Islands or even Papua New Guinea. Um, while we, while Australia and other countries trying the best to address the question, most questions that we have. But there's a long, uh, different um, course of um, uh, the problems that uh, I don't think we, we never really address this. And I think the, the, the talent of all would be in a good area to extend uh, how we can address this. Okay. The form of governance, I think that's <coughs> probably something that many of us are reflecting on because in as much as we've completed gathering ideas for our constitution the next big question for us is what kind of government will we have and i think what we've gone through as a nation has raised many questions for us um, and i think that's something that we still will explore on in terms of the traditional governments, I believe that still stands with regards to our different communities, and that's still respected, and it's something that our people can always go back to, and do go back to. The question, Sione, about peace building in the past, there's never a day when you, when the, the sessions are facilitated in different spaces, depending on who's in the group, the stories will go back to the past eh? because our conflicts are also transmitted orally. It's the way in which we tell our stories. Is it a chosen glory or chosen trauma? Is it a transformative narrative or is it a toxic narrative? And you will find that five, six generations is still telling the story like it was. Eh? So at what point does the story change? so that we can start forgiveness. And forgiveness happening because there is deep understanding. And in that lies the whole thing about reconciliation. At what point do we reconcile and do we truly know what we're reconciling for? So in my experience working with Pacific peoples, our stories are told today as if, even though the stories are old, it's like it was yesterday. And you hear time and time again the anger and the pain in these stories. Huh? And also the way that we work it is you need to choose when you're going to let go of the past, when you're going to learn, when you're going to start telling a story that's a healing story so that our children don't take up destructive ways. The, 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 the whole story about the, 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 the two high schools that's a classic one. And I think Tonga as well, respectfully, also has a similar kind of history where the schools have been, you know, fighting amongst each other because of this. Thank you. This thing about democracy being the best way. Look at them, the author of democracy, Greece, is talking to go down. And he's still all worshipping democracy as a big thing. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to bring this to an end. The conversation will no doubt continue. Uh, we have another session to bring in 15 minutes' time. So I'd ask you to join with me and send a very...